All right, everybody, uh, we've been talking a lot about currents and the motion of electrons through wires, things like that. The next natural topic is, is, is magnetism, as we'll talk about today. Um, a little bit of trivia before we kind of jump into it. Um, magnetism was known uh, back in the ancients. Um, so, for example, the Chinese were the first folks to realize that you could uh, find these uh, basically naturally curling, occurring magnetic stones called lodestones. I don't have a lodestone, I really want to get one someday. Um, but basically these lodestones were, I, I imagine they would be probably not quite as magnetic as your refrigerator magnets would. Um, but they were just magnetic enough that if you put them in water, they can tell you, uh, you know, the orientations of the Earth's magnetic field, um, which is useful for navigation. And so, um, so the Chinese were aware of this um, but it wasn't until you know the 1800s that people really understood the, the basis of magnetism, and uh, even Einstein was fascinated uh, by toy magnets as a child. And actually, relativity kind of helped to uh, understand why magnetism happens in the first place. So, just some interesting stuff for later on, as we'll talk about. Um, the short answer for how magnetism works is that moving charges create magnetic fields. Um, so that's true even in permanent magnets. So um, if I said that about wires, you'd probably say, okay, sure. There's electrons moving through wires. Those are moving charges. Those make magnetic fields. That's fine. Um, but uh, refrigerator magnets, it, it, uh, it takes a little bit more convincing, perhaps. Um, you know, how, did, how is it that a refrigerator, refrigerator magnet in, involves moving charges? Uh, it does. Uh, just trust me on that. Um, on a microscopic scale, there's there's motion of electrons that ultimately produce uh, the kind of magnetic fields that that refrigerator magnets, lodestones, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, they produce magnetic fields. Oddly enough, in spite of the fact that they're insulators, if you measure the resistance of a refrigerator magnet, you'll find that the resistance is considerable. So this is a nice video um, of uh, there's iron filings inside of a kind of a gel and they're gonna put this uh, bar magnet inside of it. And the thing that you should learn from this video, so for one, it, I like this video because it shows that the magnetic field has a 3D structure. There's gonna be a lot of drawings in the, in the next two lectures that shows a lot of 2D stuff that makes, seems to imply that it's a 2D thing, but it's not, it's 3D. They're gonna rotate this thing here. The other thing that this tells us is that um, the iron filings are moving to the places where the magnetic field is the strongest and it's this end and this end are where the magnetic field is the strongest. In the middle of the magnetic field actually isn't so big. And so that's an important thing to learn um, from this uh, example. So for example, um, so related to this, these are magnetic field lines and magnetic field lines uh, are similar in spirit to electric field lines where the electric field lines, uh, the, the cl more closely packed the lines are, the stronger the electric field is. Well, the same thing is true of magnetic field lines. So you see how close to here, all these lines are closely packed together. Likewise over here. Um, whereas out here, the lines are further apart, especially in the middle actually. Um, and so this, this drawing is codifying both the direction and the strength of the magnetic field in much the same way that the electric field did. The difference is that with magnetic fields, magnetic fields point away from uh, the north end of things. So when you have a barred magnet, there's a north end and a south end, which is uh, which is due to the which is partly why they color it, so you can see which end is north and which end is south. So I'm actually not sure which one of the, which whether this is the north end or that's the south end, but the important point is that they're different, and that the lines come from the north and they go back into the south. And so they're always coming out of the north, going into the south. You'll never see lines coming out of the south and going into the north. That just never happens, no matter how strange things may get. So a fun thing to do with a bar magnet, fun, useful, whatever you want to call it, is to take the bargain magnet and sort of bend it so that the north end is closer to the south end. Remember that the north end and the south end are where the fields are the strongest. 
Um, and so it might make sense to sort of bend it together like this so that, um, so that the field uh, in this region is overall much stronger than it would be if it was just you know, straight. Um, the other advantage of doing this is that um, it ends up creating a relatively, not just strong, but relatively uniform field. So remember that the distance between the field lines helps to codify what the magnetic field strength is. Well, the distance between all these field lines is almost exactly the same length. Not exactly. I mean, you can kind of see the colors here indicate the strength um, as well as the, the distance between the field lines. And so um, you've got a lot of yellow here, <laughs> a lot of the same color here. It gets, you know, it starts to get into greens here. But you've got a nice, fairly big region that has a relatively uniform magnetic field. Um, so this is sometimes called a horseshoe magnet, sometimes it's called a yoke magnet. We have some of these at, at Marion. Um, and uh, so, for example, I'm constantly telling stories about my friends from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Well, uh, there's experiments that we do at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base where we are trying to figure out um, what energy particles we're dealing with. Well, uh, it's very helpful for that, as we'll talk about later on in this lecture to have a uniform magnetic field so you know what the magnetic field strength that the particles are moving through and on a practical level this is one of the most effective ways to do that and it doesn't require any energy because it's just a permanent magnet so it's not like we have to like connect us to a power supply to get it to do this it just naturally creates this magnetic field for free so to speak um, I think I just said uh, a lot of these things So we're going to talk a lot about today about the what I call the magnetic force. Um, if you look in the textbook, it's often referred to as the Lorentz force, which is named after a Dutch physicist. Um, and in high school, uh, it probably looked like this. Whether, whether you had physics in high school or not is fine. Um, but it probably looks something like this, that the force, the magnetic force, is equal to the charge of the particle moving in this magnetic field times the velocity of the particle times the magnetic field strength. Um, so again, that's what it looked like in high school. In college physics, as you are now, it looks more like this. And part of the reason why it has to look more like this is because uh, forces are always vectors, right? So there's a, there is a magnitude of that force. There's a certain number of newtons, um, but it's pointing in a certain direction. Uh, velocities are always vectors, right? Because they're always pointing in a particular direction. And then the magnetic field has a strength, but it also has a direction as well. And so the magnetic field is a vector. What is not a vector is q. q is just some number. It's, it's you know, 0.1 coulombs, 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, whatever it is. There's no directionality of those coulombs. And so um, I would say the weirdest part of this equation is the cross product. Uh, now we've been talking a lot about the dot product. The dot product is very different. The dot product is the largest. Remember with all the Gauss's Law stuff, there's a lot of dot products in there. The dot product is largest when those two vectors are parallel to each other, not necessarily the same magnitude, but at least pointing in the same direction um, because there's a cosine involved in the dot product. And so the theta there is the angle between the two vectors. What is the largest that cosine theta can be? Well, that would be one, and that happens when theta equals to zero. So, uh, so you maximize the, the dot product if the two vectors are parallel to each other. Um, the cross product is very different. The cross product is largest if the two vectors are perpendicular to each other. So another way of writing this equation is like this, where um, instead of the vectors here, we have the magnitude of the velocity, in other words, the speed, um, the magnitude of the magnetic field, again, not so much the directionality, but what's the strength of it, and then sine theta, where theta is the angle between the velocity and the magnetic field. Um, and again, that force is largest when those two things are perpendicular to each other. Um, and actually, the force is zero if the velocity is uh, in if the velocity is in the same direction of the magnetic field, which is a little bit related, sort of, to like aurora, aurora borealis, northern lights, those sorts of things. Um, so this is what you get. Now, there's an interesting there's an interesting uh, issue here, which is that um, what direction is this force? Right, the force, the magnetic force, has a direction to it, um, and the rule. Uh, so that the cross product, when you, the result of the cross product is always perpendicular to both this and that. So, so the result of this cross product has to be perpendicular to the velocity, so it can't be in the same direction as the velocity. 
can't be in the same direction as the magnetic field. It has to be in some third direction. So for example, if I have some particle that's moving this way, and it's going through a magnetic field that's this way, um, what's unclear, the conundrum that I'm highlighting at this moment, the conundrum is whether the field is going to be out of the page, um, or, or, or at least the result of V cross B, is the result of V cross B going to be out of the page or into the page? Um, it's not clear. Right? It could be either one, because either one of those directions out of the page into the page is 90 degrees from the velocity and it's 90 degrees from the magnetic field. And so either one of those could be it, um, but we need some kind of rule to figure out exactly which one is it going to be. Um, and so that's when that's where the right hand rule comes in. So um, there's two different ways of doing the right hand rule. There's this way, which is my personal favorite way, and there's also this way. I really don't care which way you do it. If you learned it in high school a certain way, you can continue to do that. Um, that's fine with me. Um, for me, I like to use this way. So for example, the example I just gave where the particle is moving this way and the magnetic field is up this way, the way you do that would be to say, all right, well, the middle finger, if you're doing it this way, the, your middle finger is always in the direction of the velocity and then your palm is in the direction of the magnetic field. So the magnetic field is up. You would say that it looks like this and then you curl your fingers around and it would say that V cross B is into the page. Not necessarily the magnetic force, but at least V cross B is into the page. And that, I, and if the charge is positive, well then the force would also be into the page. But if the charge is negative, then the force might be out of the page, things like that. So that's how you do that with um, the sort of curl your palm method. Um, with this method, um, as I was saying, if 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 the if the velocity is going this this way, um, and then let's say the magnetic field is up, like that, well then it tells us that V cross B would be into the page as well, so which agrees with what I just did before. Um, and again, it's V cross B is a result. It's not necessarily the force is a result, but V cross B is a result. Um, the the one the one thing you have to to, to remember to do is remember to use your right hand for this, right? Um, sorry lefties, but um, the important thing is that you use your right hand to do this and your right hand to do this. Because um, if you use your left hand, you'll get something different. And that's, yeah, so make sure to do that. I've heard some people will use left hand for electrons and right hand for protons. If you really want to do that, you can. In other words, left hand to get the force on the electron, and right hand to get the force on the proton, right? Because um, the force is QV cross B, so whatever direction Q V cross B is, if the charge is positive, um, like, it, like it would be for a proton, well then this is going to be in the same direction as the force. So you could, in principle, do, you know, right hand for positive charges, left hand for negative charges, but that's a couple levels of madness, so but I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, these two ways should be all you need. Um, and again, find one that works. <laughs> find one that, you, that makes more sense to you. So, so again, you, f you find V cross B, and then if the charge is negative, then it's the opposite direction to that, is the actual force. Okay, public service announcement about into and out of the page. Um, this is into the page. And the reason that this is into the page is because this is supposed to be um, uh, like the quiver of an arrow. Um, so remember Hunger Games? Um, when you have an arrow, the, the tail of the arrow has uh, feathers on it, whereas the front of the arrow has a pointy thing on it. And so if the arrow is moving uh, away from you, um, then you will only see the feathery part of the arrow. Um, but if instead the arrow is moving towards you, towards your face, then you're going to see the pointy part of the arrow, and that's, that's basically the rationale here. So, so this tells you that the magnetic field is out of the page, whereas this tells you that the magnetic field is into the page, right? Because the arrow is moving away from your face, whereas this arrow is moving towards your face. There you go. Thanks, Katniss. All right. Um, so now that we've learned these rules about... Uh, 
the force on moving charges. Let's actually try to apply it. So this is an example of a wire in a uh, pretty close to uniform magnetic field. And we've got to figure out which direction it's going to get deflected. Um, in, a, in a minute, I'll show you a video of this experiment occurring, and you, you'll be able to, to, to see that it actually does happen. But for right now, let's try to figure out which direction it should go. So if you sort of rotate this in your mind just a little bit, um, so you're looking through like the north towards the south, you'll see that the, the magnetic field is sort of going to be into the page, right? So that's what it's showing here. Now right now there's no current through this wire, um, but uh, and a second later there is a current. Now um, current, the current being upwards means that uh, in reality the electrons are moving downwards. And so, um, so if I was going to try to figure out what the force on these electrons from the fact that they're moving through a magnetic field, um, the velocity vector would be let's let's use let's use this way, okay? The velocity vector would be um, down, okay? The magnetic field would be into the bay, into the page, and so that would tell us that V cross B is this way. But why isn't the force towards the right? I mean, clearly the force is going the opposite way. So why isn't why isn't the force you know towards me? Well. V cross B may be towards me, but Q V cross B, which is the actual force, is the opposite way, because right? Q is negative. And so you find the force on the electron from moving downwards would be this way. And sure enough, you'll find that the wire does in fact get deflected that way. Um, and same thing over here, if you, if you change the direction of the current, now the electrons are moving up. Now the electrons are moving up, the magnetic field is into the page, so V cross B is this way, but Q V cross B is this way, and that's the direction of the actual force. Now, if you really want to, you could look at this and you could say, well, I'm gonna make this a lot simpler. And instead of, um, I know that in reality, it's the electrons that are moving, but if, I, I know in reality the electrons are moving, but uh, this situation is a lot like positive charges moving upwards. Like that, if the if electrons are stationary and the positive charges are moving up, um, this would should still produce the same phenomena, and so I could uh, do, I could say, all right, well, the current is up, the magnetic field is into the page, V cross B is to the right, and Q V cross B because Q is positive would be, I guess, to the left. Yeah. Anyway, you would agree with with this, so that's another way to do it. Um, but maybe that's a little bit abstract. So, um, so we've talked about using this with electrons. The other thing you can do with electrons is, is use the, the curling rule. So again, if the electrons are, so if the current is up, the electrons are going down. So remember your middle finger is the direction of the velocity, then your palm is the direction of the magnetic field. And so if you curl your fingers around, it tells you that V cross V is this way. But we know that that's not the direction of the force because the electrons have negative charge, so the force would be this way on the electrons, and you'd see that the wire gets shifted that way. So no matter how you cut it, you'll, you'll find that the wire gets shoved over this way. And the next video is um, uh, an experiment along these lines in which um, they use a pretty, uh, pretty beefy um, car battery. <laughs> so when, I try, when I've tried to do this experiment at, at Marion, um, the power supplies that I've been using, that I would typically use, were only, um, I don't know, maybe like five amps or something like that. Um, car batteries, I don't know if you anything, know anything about car batteries. Car batteries can pull 100 amps if you let them. Um, and so you can pump a lot more current through here. Um, it's a bit more dangerous, but um, the more current that you pump through here, the larger the magnetic force is and the more dramatic the effect. So when I'm in Marion, I don't, so I didn't even really try to do this experiment when I'm in Marion, because every time I do it in Marion, I can just, I can barely get the wire to twitch in the magnetic fields that I can make. But in this next video, they do a really nice job and I'll have to, I'll have to turn my mic off and, and turn on, turn this thing on so you can see it.
I is coming out of the blackboard, if I cross I with B, I get a force in this direction. And so if I reverse now the current, if the current goes like this, then of course the wire wants to go down, and I will show you both. But I don't know which one will come first, because I didn't mark the poles. Ah. Oh, so you'll see it now slightly different from the way I have drawn it. I've drawn you the magnet looking this way, but it's of course much nicer for you to see it this way. So you see the wire, and there is the magnet, and now I'm going to run a few hundred amperes through that wire, and then it either will jump up or it will jump down, and then I will reverse the current, and then the opposite thing will happen. Okay, we ready for this? Three, two, one, zero. Notice there was a distinct force down. The force was so high that it even pulled down the supports. So now I can predict that if I reverse the current from this experiment, that now the wire will jump up. There we go. I know now exactly because I switched it this way, so now I will switch it this way, and the wire will jump up. That's the first drawing you see. Three, two, one, zero. Very clear. You saw it come out. All right, well, thanks, Walter. Um, as you as said, there was a few hundred amps of current there. Um, so our, our new unit of, for uh, magnetic fields is, the, is a Tesla. So if you think about F equals QVB, um, the units you come up with for that would be something like this. If you, if you were to solve for you know, B equals F over Q, QV, um, so this would be the units that you would get. And you notice that a Coulomb divided by seconds is an amp, and so it's also a Newton per amp times meter. Um, if you think about F equals QVB long enough, you can conclude that this has to be true of uh, the magnetic force on the wire. So there's a wire of some length that is pointing in some direction uh, relative to some magnetic field, and so this is this is uh, the magnetic force if it's on like a full, like let's say a rigid wire. Um, so that'll come in useful for the, the worksheet later. Now, um, when you have a charged particle moving in a magnetic field, um, you will find that it goes into a circle, um, but you don't have to take my word for it. Um, the coding activity is actually going to demonstrate this. You're going to put this in, you're going to put in the magnetic force into a code. Nowhere are you going to code it up so that it's forced to go in a circle, and you're just going to let it run and see what happens, and you'll find that Indeed, the particle moves in, in a circle, thus sparing you many pages of differential equations to prove the same thing. Anyway, the important thing for our purposes today is that um, the size of this orbit, you could say, um, depends on the charge and the magnetic field and the speed and those sorts of things. Um, and by the way, before I go into the next thing, please note that uh, the velocity here is uh, perpendicular to the magnetic field, right? So the velocity is is here, the magnetic field is into the page. So V cross B is this way, but it's positive charge, so V cross B is in the same direction as the force. And even when the particle is all the way over here, the velocity is still 90 degrees to uh, the magnetic field, and the force is still 90 degrees to, all, to, to, to both of those things. And so, um, so at the end of the day, the magnetic force is always pointing towards the center of the circle, and things naturally move in circles. Again, this is related to aurora borealis, northern lights type thing, which I've never seen myself, but one of these days I'd love to, to see it. So how does the size of the circle depend on the properties of uh, the particle moving around? Um, well, remember there's this QVB sine theta thing going on from earlier. Um, and then uh, for things moving in circles, it's the mass times um, the acceleration from objects moving in circles. So V squared over R, we talked about, this is, I believe this is called the centripetal acceleration. This was in physics 1250. Um, 
Now, as I said, the velocity and the magnetic field are 90 degrees to each other, so sine of 90 there. Um, sine of 90 is actually the peak of the sine function, so the sine function goes to 1. And then, uh, so if this reduces to QVB, we really want to solve for R, and so we can multiply both sides by R, divide both si sides by QVB, we get this. And we find that there's a V squared on the top and a V on the bottom, and so this simplifies to that. And in the programming lab, you'll actually be able to compare this to what you get in the programming lab and, and try to show, confirm or deny that this actually matches up pretty well with what the program is showing. So you can look forward to that. Now, an important thing to point out is that there's a certain amount of time it takes for the particle to do this orbit. Um, and so that period uh, is when the particle, particle goes one circumference, right? Um, the circumference, the distance divided by the speed is time, right? And so this is the circumference, the velocity, you know, V here is the speed. So that gives you the period of how long it takes to, to make it uh, one orbit. Um, and because we know what R is from in terms of the mass, the velocity, the charge in the magnetic field, it tells us that this is true. Um, which is interesting because it doesn't actually depend on the velocity of the particle. It's kind of interesting fact there. All right, next thing. So, um, so this is the magnetic field, uh, so the magnetic force activity. It's actually based on the idea of um, uh, it's something called a mass spectrometer. So for example, when you go to the airport, I believe this is true. Um, when you go to the airport, they will swab, often swab your bags with a little piece of cotton, something like that and they put it inside of a little machine. If you look, listen carefully, the machine will, will make a little sneeze like Pch! And then um, a minute later, it'll come back and say if you're you know, a terrorist or not. And what it's really doing is that it's taking some sample of stuff from your bag, and there's certain chemicals that they're looking for. So for example, ammonium, ammonium I think, ammonium nitrate particularly, but um, there's certain chemicals that, that they're looking for that are involved in making explosives, and so if there's trace residues, they want to know it. And this, this contraption, basically what it does is it takes a bunch of those molecules and it strips one electron from it. Why it doesn't strip more than one, I don't really know, but ask a chemist. But it takes a bunch of molecules from your luggage, trace molecules, um, strips an electron so it's positively charged, now this positively charge is going to accelerate it through two charged plates and then it's going to send it through a magnetic field which is going to deflect it. Now the point of doing this is that the place at which it lands uh, can reveal what the mass of that molecule is because we know that it's singly charged. You know, apparent, I don't know why it's not doubly charged or triply charged but it turns out that it's singly charged. And so if we know the charge of this thing, and we know the velocity of this thing, we know the magnetic field strength, um, the only thing we don't know is the mass. We can measure that by figuring out where does it land over here. And so this is an effective way of, of uh, figuring out uh, what the molecules are. I mean, obviously there's more than one molecule that weighs, that has a particular mass, um, but if anything they detect has, happens to have the mass of ammonium nitrate, um, they're going to escalate that and, and do more checks and all this stuff. So anyway, this is the practical basis for what your the mass spectrometer activity is based on. I think I just said all these things. Um, now this is a fun application of all this, which is uh, admittedly a bit, com a bit complicated. This is an honest to God real picture from a shuttle mission in 1996 in which they had this, um, so I mean I know it looks like it's a scene from 2001 A Space Odyssey, the movie. Um, it's not, it's a real thing. And there is a copper cable going from this thing to this part which is ultimately attached to the space shuttle. And the reason that they thought this was interesting was that they wanted to use this to generate current. The idea being is that they're moving very quickly around the Earth and so, um, and then the Earth has a magnetic field, and so there's going to be a force on the electrons on this wire, and they might be able to use that force, for example, to charge the batteries on the space shuttle. That might be a useful thing to do, and so they tried it. 
and it was a failure. <laughs> but it was, but the, the principle of it was interesting. Um, I just want to go over this briefly. Um, I don't expect you to regurgitate this for a test, but I just I want to just go through this to try to explain um, what's kind of going on here. Hopefully, you can see these magnetic field lines coming up uh, this way, right? So this is the Earth's magnetic field lines. So um, the the Earth's north pole is where magnetic south is, so the, the magnetic field lines are actually pointing up like this. And the, the point of this drawing is to say that the space state, you know, the, the shuttle and this, this contraption is going this way, it's going out of the page, so it's going around and around and around the Earth like this. And so, for example, this one has a battery, so I'm going to ignore that for a second. Let me adjust the filter here. Um, so it's not annoying. Maybe this is a little bit better. I hope that's better. Not so much. I don't know. So the so let's talk about this one. So you've got um, you know a satellite. You've got this other thing. You've got a a wire in between the two of them, and you're moving out this way, and so. The, the velocity of your electrons is this way, um, but the magnetic field is up like this. So, I'm sorry. So, velocity is this way. Sorry. Let's try this. One. Velocity is this way. Magnetic field is up. Maybe I'll try it like this with my middle finger. Velocity is this way. Magnetic field is my palm is up, right? Um, if I curl my fingers together, V cross B is this way, right? Um, but the force in the electron is not V cross B, it's Q V cross B, so these electrons get shoved uh, towards that way, right? So again, velocity electrons is out of the page, um, my palm is in the direction of the magnetic field, which is up, V cross B is this way, which means Q V cross B on the electrons is this way. So the electrons get shoved this way, and you'll notice it says the current is, is, is to the left. And so if electrons are moving this way, then the current would be to the left, right? Because the current's always the opposite direction of the electrons. Um, and then you can kind of see, it kind of implies the electrons get over here and then they sort of fly away. Um, and then the electrons here, uh, they might, um, you know, so if the current is this way, this end is gonna be positive things like that. Um, so that's basically how um, this is working. Um, but what's interesting is that uh, if you have uh, the electrons going this way, magnetic field is this way, V cross B is this way, um, Q V cross B is that way, so now we have a current that's going this way. So now that we have a current going this way, um, and the magnetic field lines are going this way, uh, the force is going to be this way, which is opposite to the velocity of the orbit, right? Because it's going around this way. And so at the end of the day, this ultimately causes, this ultimately applies a force that causes this thing to slow down. If this thing slows down, it's going to start to fall closer to the Earth. Um, and then if you have a, a battery on board, you can actually do the opposite. So if you drive a current the opposite direction, um, then now you have a current that's uh, have a current that's this way, magnetic field that's this way, um, uh, F equals QVB is this way, which is in the same direction as the orbit, and that's going to make it go a little bit faster, and it might ultimately cause this whole contraption to go to a higher orbit. So if you have a nice juicy battery, um, you can actually use that to try to increase your orbit, which might be a very helpful thing to do in space. So you can see why this would be a useful thing to try on the space shuttle. The only reason it didn't work is they couldn't keep the wire straight because the wire kept bending, which is a long story. Anyway, so normally this would never work. And the reason it would never work is because you always have to have a complete circuit for, for making currents. Like every other application in this course involves, you know, some wire that goes all the way back, wire that ultimately goes all the way back to connect to this side. The only reason this works is because, um, is because you have, you know, uh, electrons out here that can neutralize this um, and then you have electrons here that can kind of fly off so what happens is that because there's a little tiny bit of air out here 
um, that's the only reason that it works. So that this negative end, uh, the little tiny air molecules can knock the, the electrons off of this, and uh, the positive thing, so the, the, the air molecules that are out here can donate an electron to neutralize this, and that allows the current to keep on, keep on doing it. Otherwise, these things would just charge up to the extent that they can charge up, and the current would stop, right, if there was no air up there. So the, the worksheet for today uh, is kind of a silly example, but um, I love it that it's almost Halloween. I love giving this lecture in the fall semester rather than the spring because we're, we're getting close to Halloween. And so the question is that if you had some broom, so let's imagine that it's a similar situation to this, so we're not going to worry about the fact that it's not a closed circuit. Um, you have some broom that's made of copper, two meters long, and you're going to drive a bunch of current through it. And uh, your goal is to drive enough current through it so that the magnetic force is large enough that it can actually support a person. So like literally a flying kind of broomstick type deal. And so the worksheet is, is trying to figure out how much current would that actually take. Based on how much current would that take, how much voltage would it require. And then the current times the voltage is the power, how much power would that require. And then at the very end of that, the worksheet, it asks, um, you know, how much time would it take bef before these things, the ends of these things are so charged up that bad things would happen. So that's, so that's uh, the worksheet for today. Um, I get numbers that are pretty ridiculously large. So if you find super large numbers with significant fractions of the world power output, um, don't be surprised. Um, so that's what I'm going to do for now. There's other stuff in the next lecture on uh, the forces on current loops that I'm going to leave for later. Um, but that's it for today.